Uh, you had Riggins Cleaners, you had Riggins uh, Record Shop, you had Jim's Market for Food, you had and Claiborne's Restaurant. there was a restaurant. restaurant down there by the name of Claiborne's. But uh, there are so few now. We used to go to Hezekiah's to get barbecue. And I remember the Regal Theater. There were two theaters that blacks could go to at that time, Regal Theater on 10th and Princess Theater. On I used to go down there every week, you know, Friday, and sometimes during the week. You know, we do our little chore, they give us a little money, we run down there, enough for popcorn and stuff. Drews and Pruitt's. Those are the drugstores. You didn't have to go too far out of the neighborhood for anything. You know, black businesses, barbershops, grocery stores, you name it, restaurants. Uh, it was all here. Pharmacy, had a pharmacy down on 10th Street. And, uh, Struggles Hill came into being in the 1920s when uh, the first resident moved up, uh, up in this area uh, by the name of uh, George Anderson and her husband. Uh, then as the area began to progress and more residents moved in, it was stated that once you get your home or buy a home in Strugglers Hill. She had to struggle to keep the house payments going to the, in the homes that you're in. The name Strugglers Hill just developed out of that. Franklin, I don't remember too much. We had a small little house on Franklin. And then, but Tenth and Freeman was uh, very, very uh, vivid in my mind. And we lived in a small home, three bedroom with 12 children. Th no, three room house with 12 children was next to a junkyard as I was growing up. Uh, it was ice and lumber and other stuff right there on the corner of 10th and Freeman. And my house was right next to that. People were really struggling back in those days, you know, and the families helped each other. I, I only remember uh, maybe a few years that we didn't have relatives staying with us, you know, and when they got on their feet, they, you know, went and got their own places. And everybody looked out for everybody else. And I... You didn't know any, there weren't any strangers except maybe a block or two away you might not know everybody because that was a long way away at the time. When I was a kid, I remember the lake and they, you know, when it used to freeze over, they used to have skating parties there. And but that was that was something that other, other people didn't have in Kansas City. But, 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 the, but the, the, in this area, they did. And it, but I, it was just something to move up here. To even come up here just, just to walk through here, you know, when we do, when little kids, you just come through, walk through this, this area. Hmm. And Miss So and So live here, and Miss So and Mister So and So live in this house, and it was such a and pe people like uh, Mister Roosevelt Butler, he was a politician. Yeah. He worked for the city and was one of the few African Americans who 
had a, quote, position inside City Hall. He worked in the license department and was a director of the license department for the city of Kansas City, Kansas, for a number of years. I don't know. They were just people that was talented, you know, in the neighborhood. Because uh, it's like, you know, we were sort of like forced to live in the neighborhood. You think about race and segregation. I mean, I grew up in segregated society, and so this was a predominantly black community. Uh, I grew up in the 50s uh, in Kansas City, Kansas, as you said, Strugglers Hill. And so the businesses catered to the community, and the businesses were owned by, uh, by blacks. And so we, we patronized those businesses. I think some of us who grew up in segregated schools feel like we actually, um, at the time, we felt like uh, we were being well, segregated against because we weren't allowed to go to the white schools and so on. But we later realized that we did so much more by, uh, or learned so much more by being at a, a segregated school or being at a black school. I can't say much positive about segregation, uh, except for at Sumner, uh, we got teachers who had their master's degrees and working on their PhDs and they couldn't find jobs anywhere else, and uh, uh, certainly for meaningful jobs. And many of them became teachers and became very, very good teachers. We as a community depended on each other, um, and we, we had um, everything we needed from within ourselves. And we believed that we can trade elsewhere or go elsewhere or, or even um, find academic. We used to have the strongest schools and the most committed teachers in the world uh, in our own communities, uh, committed to producing the best, having standards of excellence in education and, and uh, across the board. Mr. Boone was my chemistry teacher. I remember this from, from like it was yesterday and helped us on uh, various science fair, po science fair projects. And I did a science fair project as well as uh, Dan Matthews, one of my buddies, Beckwith Harton, another buddy. And Beckwith happened to win the science fair uh, back in 1955, I think it was. Uh, he won the National Science Fair uh, uh, in Kansas City. Beckwith uh, went to KU, graduated, and I tell people, if you want to know how to remember Sumner, when you get in your car, and if you don't put your seatbelt on, it will go ding, ding. That's Beckwith's heart and invention. I'm not saying we were angels, but we tried to uh, do the best we could and try to, you know, have top honors and be on the honor roll and National Honor Society and, you know, have people who were athletes. And everybody just seemed to want to try to achieve. Uh, unfortunately, uh, some didn't make it and for a number of reasons. And I think that uh, it, 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 it's, it's economic. Uh, many of us were poor, and, uh, but that was never used as an excuse. So you had limited incomes, uh, you had parents with limited education. So when you have to say, what, what's the ingredient? It's a combination of all those things. The support from, uh, from the church, I think, is important. Uh, support of family is extremely important. And economics uh, is very important. And, and it all relates to education. And with education, you give the ability to, uh, to learn skills and to, uh, to compete for jobs. You were expected to excel. You were told that you had to be better in order to even get an even break. That was drilled into your head. And you have to think about yourself as, you know, people might think you're nothing, but you have to think that you're something. So the combination of uh, good teachers, the combination of uh, parents that cared about us, uh, and the combination of of getting the kind of education that we received, I think positioned many of us for, for what we did later in life. Politicians, teachers, they all lived in this, in this, in this neighborhood. I can remember judges that were black uh, at the time uh, that I was in Kansas City. My father started or helped start Douglas State Bank when I was six years old. And then uh, my father was working at Atlanta Life Insurance Company at that time. And then we, when he left there to start his own company, uh, which was Crusader Life and later became American Women's Life, it just seemed like uh, the people that I was around, it just, you know, it just kind of all fell in, into place. Persons like Bishop Gregg, who was internationally known when he moved here in 1933, was one of the persons uh, would attract people. 
people would want to live in an area where a person of this caliber, even at that time in 1933, lived. He was asked by President Roosevelt to uh, be a special emissary to visit African-American troops around the world. Uh, he uh, also was president of Western University, which is located right here in the Kansas City area, which he did some amazing things there also. Well, you know, Uncle Alex was kind of a maverick in the family. You know, my, my, my father and my other uncle, Julius, were pretty straight-laced more so, and Uncle Alex was um, always doing some project. Alex, when he started writing about the history, he had remembered as a child growing up in Hennons, Tennessee, his aunts talking about the story of Kenti Kunte. And when he decided to write the story, two of the aunts were dead, and the only one still alive was George Anderson, who lived at 1200 Everett. He was one of the first ones who did Playboy interviews, um, the interviews with Playboy. So no one could read, you know, the interviews, you know, they were say, well, we hear he's a good writer, but no one, and he did Reader's Digest, which was a, l a lot better, he did some interviews. And he had done Malcolm X, which eventually became the autobiography of Malcolm X. So his coming back and forth to Kansas City, Kansas, here to Strugglers Hill, 1200 Everett, to visit with Cousin Georgia, um, there was a, it was a mixed blessing, you know. Private industry used to be down here. We had all, like up in Minnesota, we had all the stores you could want, Montgomery Wards, Pennies, Hillsburgs, you know what I mean? Movie theaters, you know, five and dime stores, restaurants. There is no store here now in the area. Apple Mart at 7th and State closed uh, about three months ago now. It didn't change until, you know, as the people started getting older, and uh, then they moved out or either, you know, they passed away. So a lot of, a lot of our friends and a lot of the people we knew that really made Strugglers feel, uh, a lot of them are gone. We don't have a lot of uh, children uh, that are staying in the area. When they graduate, they leave out. And my father used to say, you know, we'll never improve Kansas City if everybody gets their knowledge here and then they take it away. We have to be mindful of what has, you know, the people that were there before us and how they, how they went for, you know, the way that they lived, what they, what they sacrificed, what they, whatever they have given. And I just wish there, you know, we just gonna, ha we need to share the history of Struggler's Hill with others so they can realize the significance of this area. I mean, if we sit down and talk with our elders, they're happy to, uh, usually happy to share with us a part of the history as they recall it. And in this internet, Facebook world, you know, that um, a child or a grandchild or a relative would take time to sit down and listen, I think would be uh, met with equal, uh, equal pleasure today as it was when Uncle Alex was talking to Cousin Georgia at 1200. And that's why our neighborhood association has been trying to improve that and uh, by exposing the neighbors to various uh, activities. And that's the only way it will work. It has to be people that care for other people and uh, where we're all looking out for each other. That's for the community and unity. Uh-huh. That's it, that, that's the whole thing. Without the unity, you don't have nothing. I hope that people will hear uh, the story and keep the legacy alive, keep the area alive and realize that because of some of the things that the persons of Strugglers Hill, you know, the things that they've accomplished, the things that they did, they will be able to continue the history.